Okay. All right. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for coming today. It's a beautiful day today, and we're so glad you are here today as we celebrate uh, more wonderful radio shows and Gold Age Radio. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to another episode of Those Thrilling Days of Yesteryear, a live recreation of some of your favorite shows from the Golden Age of Radio. Now, today, Excuse we me, have... Excuse Julie. Uh, there's somebody who wants to see you over there. Uh, okay, wait. Can we wait? We're big, no, just starting a show. <laughs> We're sorry, but it seems pretty urgent. You should really go check it out. Yes, but don't worry. We'll cover for you. The audience won't notice the thing. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm sure you do just fine, kids, but I mean, you're just a bunch of kids. You don't know how to run a show like this. It's pretty difficult. Oh, please. You'll just take one minute. Yeah, and we can get the show... We can go get on with the show. Well, all right. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry. I apologize for this. Uh, apparently, there's something that has come up and that needs my attention. Uh, I'll be right back. Kids, hold the fort until I get back. All right? Don't you worry. Everything will be just fine. You can count on us. Um, okay. Uh, excuse me. I'll, I'll be right back. What is going on? Boy, I thought he'd never leave. <laughs> All right, gang, let's do this show the right way. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of those thrilling days of yesteryear. A live recreation from your favorite shows of the golden age of radio. Now, we all know that many wonderful shows back in the 40s and 50s that featured a lot of famous adults. But sometimes, kids have important things to say, too, and they should be listened to. And kids were also very popular in old-time radio. They showed up and helped some of their greatest stars. In fact, some kids had their own shows. That's right. In fact, there was one such show that began right here in Chicago, and it was a national hit for 13 years. It was called The Quiz Kids, and it featured real kids answering trivia questions of all types. History, mathematics, science, government, other topics and themes. Some questions were really, really hard. Yes, but some of the kids were also really, really smart, and they answered them without any help from the adults. Occasionally, they would bring on guests, you know, like scientists professors, and other smart adults to try to beat the kids in the competition. But it almost always turned out that the kids were smarter. Our first show today originally aired back on April 16, 1941. Well, that was before you were born. That was before any of us were born. <laughs> and it featured a very special guest, Mr. Jack Benny, who thought he could take on the quiz kids. And, well, we'll let you see what happens. Yeah, you think that he would learn his lesson. When it was about five years later, he invited Quiz Kids over to appear on his show for a rematch, this time with the help of his own gang. The episode originally aired on May 12, 1946. And as you see, things didn't turn out as well as Mr. Benny planned. When will adults ever learn never to underestimate us kids? <laughs> and don't forget, the song we're going to do in between two shows. That's right. Some of you have probably heard of the singer, Bing Crosby. Well, he became really famous in a movie called Going My Way, and it's there he sang one of his most popular songs with a bunch of kids. Well, actually, it was the kids who made it such a great song. Adults, they'll, they'll never make it without us kids to help them along the way. And now we'll do our best to recreate these shows for you, just as they aired, with music played by another kid, sound effects also by kids, and maybe we'll even let in an adult or two to come help us out. While you're listening, you might pretend you were one of those fortunate to be in the audience that was live there and watch your favorite performers do the same thing. Or perhaps you might wish to sit back, close your eyes, and imagine you are sitting in a living room in front of an old Philco radio, anxiously waiting for your favorite show to begin. So join us as we take you back to those thrilling days of yesteryear. Here they are, the Quiz Kids, presented to you by the makers of Alka-Seltzer. We're on the air with the School Kids Questionnaire. The Quiz Kids, five bright, lovable youngsters ready for another difficult examination on the Alka-Seltzer School Room of the Air. The examination tonight will be conduct conducted in exactly the same manner as all our regular Wednesday night Quiz Kids programs. 
and as usual, none of the children have been seen or have seen or heard any of the questions in advance. I'll say we haven't. Let's get going. Here. All the questions were sent in by you listeners and were selected by Sidney L. James of the editorial staffs of Time and Life magazine. I don't care who the land. A new senior portable radio will be awarded to the I sender of each control. question used on his program tonight. And now, our chief quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we'll proceed directly to the roll call. Rachel. I'm Rachel Williams. I'm 11 years old, and I'm in the sixth grade at Harrison School, East Chicago, Indiana. Jake Lukel. I'm Jack Lukel. I'm 14 years old, and I'm a freshman at Oak Park and River Township High School. Joan. I'm Joan Bishop. I'm 14 years old, and I go to the Chicago School for Adults. Claude. I'm Claude Brunham. I'm 12 years old and I'm a sophomore at Stem High School in Chicago. Gerard. I'm Gerard Darrell. I'm 8 years old and I go to Broadway School in Burnham. And Jackie. I am Jackie Benny. I'm 6 years old. I didn't have a chance to go to school at all. I was just a poor boy and I used to stand on the corner selling papers, barefoot in the winter. And I used to say, extra, extra. Paper here, get your paper. Play it, please. Hmm, fine chance I'm going to have here. I can see that. You know. All right, I know just as much as the kids, you know. You know, you, you just ask the questions, that's all. Jackie, please. Now, incidentally, uh, where are your curls? What? Where are your curls? On my lap. They got hot. Well, while we're getting ready for our first question, just a word or two from Ken Carpenter. Here's a word of friendly advice to all you parents and older folks. Alkalize with Alka-Seltzer. Yes, the next time you eat too much or too fast or eat while under stress or strain, alkalize with Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer is just the thing to relieve the misery of acid indigestion and distress after meals. It helps to neutralize excess stomach acid and so often the immediate cause of the distress of an upset stomach. That isn't all. You see, Alka-Seltzer is a pain reliever. And if you have a sickish headache along with the stomach upset, Alka-Seltzer can bring you a mighty comforting relief in both of these disturbances. Be wise. Take Alka-Seltzer. You'll feel better fast. You said it, brother. <laughs> Quiet, please. Uh, we will now start with the questions. All right, quiz kids. R.S. Hart of Seattle, Washington, says that he was in the desert, and after taking an analysis of the only water available, found that it was 100% aquafontis. Would you drink such water, Joe? Yes, I would. Can you give us any further? Anything further? Well, aquafontis is fountain water. That's right. It's a, uh, well, it's really spring water, Joan. Oh. Uh, yes, it's I see. spring water, Joan. That's right. That's right, Mr. Kelly. It's spring water. Uh, yes, I know. It says so on my card. I know. Yeah. That's where I saw it before. <laughs> All right, the next question. Pete McDonald of Vernon, Oregon, a schoolboy who says he never enjoyed anything in school but recess until he began listening to the Quiz Kids, sends him this one. Incidentally, he adds that his grades are improving, and here it is. If you had something that contains a prothorax, a mesothorax. A meso what? A metothorax. A meso what? Or what did you say? A, a meso what? A, a meso what? A mesothorax. Oh, a mesothorax. That's right. A metothorax and a Gerard, you answer. Gerard, you answer. You, have, Gerard, Gerard, you, answer. you yeah. had your hand up first. No, Mr. Benny. Yes. Don't put it in, please. Well, you can see I'm Mr. actually going to have a fine chance here today. The and the metothorax and prothorax are all part of the thorax, which is uh, part of the, uh, a part of an insect on the uh, <clears throat> part between the abdomen and the head on an insect. Well, good for you, Gerard. That was Mark. <laughs> That's very good. I used to know that when I went to school. You know, when you get older, you forget those things. Uh, that's all. I can't remember everything. Now our next question. I used to know algebra, too, when I went to school. <laughs> Quiet, please. Oh. Now, Mrs. Burdette E. Truesdown of New York City says you can prove you have a good background by naming at least three persons whose names will live forever because their names have been used to identify their chief contribution to humanity. For example, the name of Renshaw is perpetrated in the word Renshunology, 
Applaud. Uh, Nobel, who was a Swiss scientist who discovered dynamite, and he, uh, he, he gives out prizes to people who do something great for the world. That's fine, Claude. Now let's see what Joan has to offer. Well, there's Calvinism, that's the doctrine as to the downfall of man, and Darwinism, the theory of anthropology. Very good, Joan. Jack Lucal? Well, there's Alessandro Volta. His name is perpetuated in the volt, which we use to measure electricity. And James Watt, they use his name too for the watt. Nice going, Jack Lucal. Let's see, uh, Rachel? Uh, well, Martin Luther and the word Lutheran, which is a church. And, uh, uh, Dr. Rentengen, who discovered the Rentengen rays. That's very, very good, Rachel. Um, uh, Jackie, has his hand up. What? Well, there was this fella named Max. He, uh, had something to do with a Maxwell. Max. <laughs> Maxwell. You know, now wait a minute, Jack. What? Now that's, there's no connection there. There is two. A fella named Max sold me my car. Sure did. Max Maxwell. Well. The name was Max Miller. Certainly got a fine chance on this program. Well. Me. Should have stayed on with my own jello show. It's beside the point, but we'll accept it as half right. Now it's about time. Uh, Claude? Also there's Ja Francois and Pear. He had to do something with the elect electricity and his name lives in the end. That's right, Claude. Oh, the Ampere, the Ampere. Jack Lugo? <coughs> well, there's Cadillac and LaSalle. They were French explorers, and their names are the names of automobiles. Very good, Jack Lugo. I guess that will hold Jackie for a while. All right, our next Of question. course, if everybody's going to get laughs on this program, I'm going home. Gerard? Well, there's also DeSoto, who was named after a car, and he was a Spanish explorer that found the Mississippi. That's right, Gerard. I am glad you brought that up. Now, what about Johnny Chev that made the Chevrolet? For heaven's sakes, if you're going to go into that kind of stuff, you know, Johnny Chev. What about Harry Stude, from the Studebaker? If you're going to go into that stuff, I can answer a million of you, you know, just asking me the questions, that's all. We'll all withdraw from the garage right now and get into our next question. Miss Margaret Faith of Camden, New Jersey. Can't see it all. I can see that. Poses the mountain climbing and mathematics problem. A mountain climber was making his way along a mountainside ledge when... Well, the, pardon me? Uh, uh, what, what was the question? What did you say? A Miss Margaret Faith of Camden, New Jersey. Oh, 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 Camden, New Jersey. I see. Yes. Yes, well, important to the question. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, let's see. Uh, where were we? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, here we are. A mountain climber was making his way along a mountainside ledge at an altitude of 6,440 feet. While edging his way, he accidentally kicked a rock which went flying towards the bottom of the mountain and some animals who had to scurry for shelter. Ignoring the friction of the air, how long did the animals have to reach safety before the rock hit? Now you got to do this in your heads, kids. No pencil and paper. No. What was the last question again, please? Uh, how many? Uh, how long did it take? One? Well, that is the question. How long did it take? Oh, uh, one minute and forty-three seconds. That's wrong. Certainly got a fine chance here, Rachel. Twenty seconds. Twenty seconds is correct. She's very rude. I tripled it. Well, nice going, kids. And though I don't think you need it, you can rest a moment now. It's recess time. We've been telling you over and over again about Alka-Seltzer. Well, we've told you about how good it is, how convenient and economical, and how fast it can bring relief to the distress of so many common ailments. And now, suppose we let Alka-Seltzer speak for itself. All right? First of all, we take two Alka-Seltzer tablets from the package, drop them into a glass of water, listen. You hear that fizzing, sparkling sound? Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, it is good. It looks good, tastes good, and is so good for relief in so many common ailments. That's Alka-Seltzer, all right. The two-in-one remedy. Two kinds of relief in one glass. First, Alka-Seltzer is a pain reliever. Just what you want for the relief of a headache or sore, aching muscles. And second, Alka-Seltzer is an alkalizer. Just what you need when excess stomach acid, acid upsets your stomach and causes distress. Be sure to try a sparkling glass of Alka-Seltzer the next time any of these annoying ailments cause you trouble. See your, for yourself how good it is, how fast it can make you feel better. Ask your druggist for Alka-Seltzer. Ladies and gentlemen, 
ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the Quiz Kids, presented every Wednesday night at this time by the makers of Alka Salsa. Now, just a word about the questions. You can win a new Zenith portable radio with patent, patented built-in wave magnet if you send us a question which our question editor finds suitable for use on the air. Yes, Alka Salsa awards a famous Zenith portable radio for each question used on this program. Just mail your questions by postcard or letter to Quiz Kids National Broadcasting Company, Chicago. That's Quiz Kids National Broadcasting Company, Chicago. We reserve the right to reward to reword questions. And if light questions are submitted, the first received will be used. All questions become property of Quiz Kids. So send in your questions and win a radio. All right, Joe, are you ready with the... You better see I get that $100 bond, too. That's all right, all worry about. Joe, are you ready with the scores at the halfway point? Yes, Cat. Uh, but in deference to our guest contestant, I hesitate to read them. I think I'll just let them go until after the second question session. Maybe a miracle will happen. By the way, Rachel, I, uh, that, that last question we had before the bell, can you tell us how you worked that out? Well, Mr. Kelly, anybody falling through space, disregarding the friction of the air, accelerates at the rate of 32 and 2 times feet per second. And so, in the rule, the distance equals the times in seconds, squared equals 16 and 1 times, times the time squared. So I divided 6,440 by 16 and 1 tenth and got 400, which is the square of the times in seconds. So I extracted the square root, and that gave me 20. So the answer is 20 seconds. <laughs> Now, that's where I made my mistake there. You see, I, I, took the, um, I took the least common multiple there. That's where I got it wrong. That's where I got the minute and 43 second thing there, you see. You're telling us. I sort of square rooted it there. Okay. Uh, yes, well, uh, let's get along here now. Uh, here's a question from Mrs. Daniel Stormont of Evanston, Illinois. 5,280 feet is one mile. What? Uh, what did you say? I said 5,280 feet is one mile. Well, nobody asked that. Well, if they do, I'm ready. Watch out. <laughs> All right, we'll continue. All right. If you told the election board you were a mug, well, who's a mug? Would you be listened to as a Republican, Democrat, Socialist, or Independent? Now, there, this is a tough one. And if you told the election board you were a mug, would you be listed as a Republican, <coughs> Democrat, Socialist or independent? I didn't tell anybody I was a mug so uh, Claude? Well, I, uh, Claude. I'll take a guess. I'll say independent. That's right. Now, how did you guess it? I just guessed. Oh, <laughs> you just guessed. That's right. You see, the political name of the mug well, let's see what Joan has to say. Well, I rather thought it was independent, too, because there's a column in one of our Chicago papers called mug -wump. That's true. On politics. But you see, the political name of Mugwump started in 1848, when it was applied to supporters of James G. Blaine, who switched to Cleveland because of his civil service views. Blaine was a Republican candidate for president. Uh, Jackie, uh, I know what a Mugwump is. Uh-oh. Uh, you do, uh, all right. A Mugwump is a bird that sits on the fence with its mug on one end and its wump on the other. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Benny, I'm afraid you're wrong. Now let's at least have a little more discipline, please. Well, I... Getting back to the political situation, uh, Jackie Benny, who was the President of the United States in 1901? Grover Cleveland. That's wrong. Well, I ought to know. I voted for him. <laughs> it was Grover Cleveland. You're wrong. It was William McKinley's. Wish I had a history book, brother. That's all. I've got one. Well, give it to me. i got a low chair here. Over Cleveland, that's who it was. Uh, let's continue with our next question. Pauline Salzman of Grand Rapids, Michigan, found these ads in the paper. Tell me it isn't Grover Cleveland. I know Grover Cleveland. Why, please? I'd like to present this question. Pauline Salzman of Grand Rapids, Michigan, found these ads in the paper. She would like you to tell her just what is advertised. Here's the first item. For rent, Colonial, Colonial Estate near Charlottesville. Virginia, designed by owner. Adjoining buildings make the state virtually a community. Right owner, T.J. Charlottesville, Virginia. Jackie Benny, you're holding up your hand. I'm waving at some friends in the audience. I can have some friends, can't I? Hello, baby! 
Well, let's complete this question. Uh, Rachel? Monticello. Monticello, the home of? Thomas Jefferson. That's right. That's right. Good for you. Now, here's the next item. I have friends in the what audience. Say, so what the devil? Quiet, please. Here's the second part of the question. For sale, sacrifice, 10 million marble building in the land of Vega stands on 313 feet foot square construction completed. Claude? That's the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal in India. Good for you. And it took 22,000 men 22 years to build it. And I'm right about Grover Cleveland, too. Tell me about Grover Cleveland, you know. Now we'll continue. All right. Frank O. Estes of Towson, Maryland, sent in this way. Last week, his wife was shopping to get her girlfriend's gift. She bought Sue a green umbrella for $2.95. Ellen, a blue scarf for $2.50. Joanne, a brown leather pocketbook for $2.99. And Priscilla, a yellow sports skirt for $3. What was the color of the scarf for Ellen? Joan? Blue. Blue is right. Good for you. Mm. 1901 was Grover Cleveland. I know because I won a pair of cloth top shoes on the election. I remember that. Well, we'll forget about Grover Cleveland. I won't forget about it. Well, uh, this is next Burns question. me up, you know. Come over here and do the best Quiet, you can. Quiet, please. Tommy Haytop. Tommy Haytop. Tommy Haytop. Jack. What about Tommy Haytop? Uh, Jack, I'm reading a name. All right, read a name. All what right. do I care? All right. I'm not going to Tom. Just came over as a guest. That's what burns me up. You know? Tom, Tommy hates him. Listen, Jack. Yes. I'm beginning to think that you're getting into the, what little hair I've got left. Well, I can always tell you where to get a toupee. You know. <laughs> Tommy Haytap of Minneapolis, Minnesota, wants you to sing or hum these notes as I give them to you, and stop me as soon as you recognize the scales you are singing. All right. Here's the first one. Uh, C. That was Joan. <laughs> All right, Joan. D. Uh, e flat. Uh, F. Uh, G. Uh, A flat. Uh, B. Uh, C. Uh, Do you recognize the scale? That's C harmonic minor. That's very good. Here's the next one. C. Uh, C sharp. Uh, D. Uh, D sharp. Uh, e. Uh, F. Uh, I tell you what we're going to do. We've got some other hands up. I'm going to give this one to Claude. That's a chromatic. Chromatic is correct. <laughs> and here's the last one. C. Uh, D. Uh, e flat. Uh, F. Uh, G. Uh, A. Uh, B. Uh, C. Uh, B flat. Uh, Rachel? That is melodic. Melodic is good. Good for you, Dave. <laughs> Why don't you give me something once in a while? Now, quiz kids, you'll need mythology. I have my hand up all the time. Nobody calls on me. Starting You'll need mythology like, as well as orientology to answer this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ethel Baker of St. Louis, Missouri, wants to know who Is that Paul got. Baker's sister? Ethel? Uh, that isn't Paul Baker's sister, eh? Uh, when you want to talk, Jackie, will you please hold up your hand? Oh, because I know an Ethel Baker, you know. Now, that was Paul Baker's sister. Well, remember to hold up your hand when you want to say something. All right, I'll hold up my hand. For goodness sake, you sit there. What is he, the boss or something? Quiet, please. <laughs> the last time I come on this show, you're telling us. <laughs> now, let's see. Uh, where am I? Oh, yes. Uh, here I am, right here. Oh, I don't care if I do. Ethel Baker of St. Louis, Missouri, wants to know why peacock claw feathers are spotted. Gerard? The peacock has has eyes in its tail because uh, the mer the myths you see when a uh, long time ago Jupiter married Juno after a few years became jealous of her and turned her into a calf and he sent Argus to watch her but Juno 
turned herself right back into regular form, and Argus was the one that had a hundred eyes in his head, and Juno killed Argus and put the eyes in the peacock's tail. Well, thank you very much, Ray. That was a very fine description. Jackie, I see you've got your hand up. I'm wiping my forehead. It's hot in here. Didn't even raise my hand. Fine, we'll continue. Most ridiculous question I ever heard. James Wilson Jr. of Toledo, Ohio, wants you to compose a second line to his one-line verse. Here it is. Fred Allen has a funny show. I'm going home. Now you keep your seat, all right. Fred Allen has a funny show. Let's hear a second line to that. Joan? Fred Allen has a funny show, but there's nothing he doesn't know. Very good, Joan. All right, let's have another one. We'll know what's so funny about that show, boy. Gerard? When Mr. Benny hears that, he'll surely blow. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, Jackie, what have you got to offer? Fred Allen has a funny show. How he does it, I don't know. His jokes are old, his gags ain't funny. He ought to be paid with Confederate money. The end. <laughs> now then. Now then, here is really one for you, Jack, Jackie Benny. Listen to About this. time, the father's listening in. All right, tell me. How many strings on a violin? Five. I mean four. Four. Very good. Now, how do you spell rosin? R-O-S-O-N. Rosin. That's wrong. It's R-O-S-I-N. I can't understand it. I've been using it for years. Well, there's the bell, kids. I'll have your scores in just a moment. Have you had your vitamins today? Well, here's the answer to your daily vitamin A and D problem. Take one a day brand vitamins, A and D tablets, now offered and guaranteed by the makers of Elka Seltzer. Each one a day tablet is equal in vitamin A and D content to two whole teaspoonfuls of cod liver oil, meeting minimum United States pharmacopoeia standards. One a day is all you take, one a day is all you need, and a penny a day is all it costs. Listen to these low prices. 30 tablets, 35 cents. 39 tablets, 99, 90 tablets, only 85 cents. 180 tablets, only a dollar and a half. One a day is all you take, and one penny a day is all it costs. Remember, one a day brand vitamin A and D tablets have been developed and are guaranteed by the makers of Alka Seltzer. Tested and approved by Good Housekeeping Bureau and commended by Consumer Service Bureau of Parents Magazine. Every member of your family should take one-a-day tablets every day. Ask your druggist for one-a-day tablets. That's the name. One-a-day brand. Look for the big one on the package. As a group, you only missed one question tonight. And the individual winners are Rachel first, Joan second, and Claude third. And of course, I knew I wouldn't be on there. I congratulate you. I, I congratulate you. As I said before, I congratulate all you quiz kids and take pleasure in presenting to each of you, on behalf of the, of the makers of Elka Seltzer, a $100 denomination United States savings bond. And Jackie? I don't have one for you. You see, these bonds are to help the children pay for their future education. And we don't think you'd spend your money in going to college. But here's a Zenith portable radio. Maybe you can learn something listening to it. Quiz kids every Wednesday night. Well, at least I can hawk the radio. <laughs> Friends, we'll be back in Chicago next week and we'll resume competition with only the three highest scores remaining for the succeeding examination. The three winners on our last competitive program were Claude, Rachel, and Jack. Completing the board will be Gerard and Joe, the same children on the program tonight. Meanwhile, this is Joe Kelly dismissing the Quiz Kids class until next Wednesday at the same time. Good night, kids. Good night, Mr. Kelly. Come on, ask me more questions. Uh, let's get going here. Listen again next Wednesday night to the Quiz Kids, the makers of Alpha Salsa, present three programs each week, all of them on NBC Networks. On Friday night, Alec Templeton time. On Saturday night, the famous Alpha Salsa National Bond Dance. Next Wednesday night, again, the Quiz Kids. For interesting variety and entertainment, listen to the Alka Salsa shows. Can Carpenter
Ramona speaking. This is the National Broadcast Company. Swing on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar, and be better off than you are. Or would you rather be a mule? A mule is an animal with long, funny ears. He kicks up at anything he hears. His back is brawny and his brain is weak. He's just plain stupid with a stubborn streak. And by the way, if you hate to go to school, you may grow up to be a mule. Oh, would you like to swing on a star? Carry moonbeams home in a jar, and be better off than you are. Or would you rather be a pig? A pig is an animal with dirt on his face. His shoes are a terrible disgrace. But if you don't care a feather or a fig, you may grow up to be a pig. Would you like to swing on a star, carry moonbeams home in a jar, and be better off than you are? Or would you rather be a fish? A fish won't do anything but swim in a brook. He can't write his name or read a book. And to fool the people is the only thought. Yeah, but eating on your slippery you still get cut. But then if that sort of life is what you wish, you may grow up to be a fish. And all the monkeys are in a zoo. Every day you meet quite a few. So you see it's all up to you. You can be better than you are. You could be swinging on a star. The Jack Benny program. Starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from Chicago, which is just a stone's throw away from Waukegan, we bring you something that was thrown back. Here he is, Jack Benny! Benny's talking, and Don, I'm very proud of this turnout here in Chicago. Uh-huh. Why, this auditorium is packed. Do you know that there are 3,724 people sitting in the audience? 3,724 people? How do you know? I counted them as they came through the door. I forgot the tickets were free. <laughs> but that's all right, I'll get them on the soda fountain, yeah? Now leave it to me. Well, Jack, since we're broadcasting so close to Waukegan, I presume your father's in the audience. Yes, yes he is, Donnie. He just got back from a trip to Florida, Havana, and Bermuda. Oh, I thought your father spent most of his time at home. He used to, Don, but since he, uh, he won the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest, he's <laughs> traveled. He's been all over, you know. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I thought according to the rules, your relatives we're not allowed to enter the I Can't Stand Jack Benny competition. Don, when he heard about the contest, he disowned me. So it's perfectly legal. Well, Jack, I bet you didn't get enough any... Uh, I'll bet you didn't get many contest letters from the people in Chicago. They seem to like you here. They certainly do, Don. They, did you see that reception I got at the station? Why, they tore the shirt right off of me. Of course, I don't blame them. After all, it isn't very often they get to see two movie stars at the same time. Two movie stars? I have a picture of Charles Boyer tattooed on my chest. <laughs> you have? Oh, I, I didn't. I don't believe it. 
Open your shirt. All right, there. Well, sure enough, Charles Boyer. Jeff, what's the idea? It's a little trick I use for close-ups. You see, when I raise my arm, he smiles. Mm -hmm. oh, you'd be surprised how this tattoo of Boyer on my chest has helped me to... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. Gee, Mary. Gee, Mary, you're certainly looking very cute today. I haven't seen you since we got off the train. How about a big kiss? Okay. Open your shirt. He's for close-up, for heaven's sake. Now, Mary, uh, you mean that Jack showed that, you that picture of Boy, Boyer on his chest? Oh, he shows it to everybody. Jack's got the only shirt that works like a Venetian blind. Venetian blind, Venetian. <laughs> Mary, you're just jealous because of the big reception I got when I arrived in Chicago. Big reception? Yes. When the train pulled in, there were thousands of people at the station. Mayor Kelly was there. There were flags flying. And a big brass band, too. Yes, sir. And it was all for me. It was not. They were welcoming a carload of coal. Oh, is that what it was? You should have known when the band played. Keep the home fires burning. Yeah, well, I never thought of that. Anyway, Mary, here we are in Chicago. You know, this is known as the Windy City. Well, I know, Jack. Yesterday, I saw you chasing your hair down the street. It wasn't my hair I was chasing. It happened to be a cat. A cat? <laughs> yes, a cat. <laughs> then why were you trying to coax it back with a saucer of Fitch shampoo? Mary, if you can't be nice to me, think of Boyer. And besides, there are a lot of my friends here from Waukegan. Oh, that's right, Jack. Your hometown is close to Chicago, isn't it? Close? Why, I could take a silver dollar out of my pocket and throw it as far as Waukegan. Let me see you do it. I will not throw a dollar. You tricked me into that once. The string broke, and by the time I found it in the place where it said, it was worth 60 cents. So don't try it. Cheer up, Chicago, you. Dim out is bad, but here comes Harris, that bright little lad. Yes, turn on that switch and let me loose. Oh, that opera house. It's my bread and butter, butter Jackson. Yeah, it's nice over there. Hey, Phil. Yes? Uh, what, do you, what do you want to come in here with an entrance like that for? Uh, this dim out in Chicago is a serious thing. Oh, you're not kidding, Jackson. It is. Last night, Frankie, my guitar player, wore, wrote out a check, and it was so dark he signed somebody else's name. What? Now they got him charged with arson. Arson? You mean forgery? No, arson. That check was so hot, it burned down the bank. <laughs> oh, Harris, you may not have bushy eyebrows, but you sure keep the country in an uproar. Okay, fine, fine. You know, Phil, if Frankie did a thing like that, he must have been drinking. Oh, no, no, living, no. Not my little Frankie, he's on the wagon. Why, he hasn't had a drink, that kid hasn't had a drink since, uh, um, since, uh, well, since when? Uh, wait a minute, I'm looking at my watch. Mm, that's what I thought. Phil, forget about Frankie. After all, we came to Chicago to do a show, so let's do it. Yeah, good old Chicago. This is a great town, Jackson, but a little windy, isn't it? Well, of course. That's why they call it the Windy City. Yeah, yeah. Say, Jackson, now, what was that I saw you chasing yesterday? Oh, well, that was a cat. Uh, then how come when you caught it, you shook it out and put it on your head? I didn't put it on my head, it jumped up there. <laughs> then why did it have bangs? Because it jumped on backwards. <laughs> that happened to anybody. And Mary, if I were you, I wouldn't be so smart just because we're away from home. You know, Marshall Fields is not unlike the May Company. You know that. And it won't be much fun working in the dark either. Say, Jackson, I meant to ask you. How come they got this dim out here in Chicago? Phil, don't you know what's going on? Don't you read the papers? It's a count of the coal shortage. Yeah, isn't it awful? Huh? Oh, uh, hello, Dennis. Last night it was so dark. Anyway, I Phil, find... Phil, as I was saying, it's, it's easy to understand. You have to have coal to make a list of electricity. Sorry. <laughs> uh, last night it was so dark I couldn't find my way back to the hotel. You couldn't, then. You see, Phil, coal is the fuel they burn in boilers. Three times I fell over a fire no, That's too bad. Now, they burn the coal to heat the water into steam, and then they... Finally, an old lady had to help me across the street. Really? And then they use the steam... Used to be a Girl Scout. Good. 
Good. And then they use the steam to spin the turbines what generate the electricity. Well, then how come we don't have a dim out in Los Angeles? Well, out there, we don't use coal. We, you see, we get our electricity from Boulder Dam. Ooh, what he said. Dennis, Boulder Dam is a place... He said it again! Now look, Dennis, I'm trying to explain something to Phil. Would you just be quiet until it's time for your song? Okay, but I don't know if I'll be able to sing good. I'm tired. Tired? Yeah, I had an awful time on the train. It's tough trying to sleep between Mr. Harris and his guitar player. Too crowded? No, they kept setting the bottle on my stomach. Oh. And then they were using my ear as an ashtray. Oh, well, uh, well, don't worry, Dennis. You can get plenty of sleep while we're here in Chicago. And then, we'll, oh, come in. Yes? Well, here we are, Mr. Betty. Huh? Don't you remember when you invited us over? We're the Quiz Kids. Oh, yes, yes, the Quiz Kids, yes. <laughs> oh, look, look, come on over here. Look at that over there. Now, take off your hats, kids. Take off your hats. Come right in and sit down and watch the show. Watch the show? I thought you invited us over for a quiz contest. A contest? You mean you kids want to compete with us? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. So that would be like taking candy from a baby. Oh, come on now, Mr. Benny. You're not a baby. That's not what I mean. <laughs> now, when I gave you those four tickets, I merely wanted you to come over and enjoy the show. Buy a few bottles of soda pop and relax. That's all. Oh, Jack, they're only kids. If they want a contest, let's give it to them. But, Mary... You can ask them easy questions. What? Oh, oh, sure, sure. We'll play with them, have a lot of fun. Well, uh, all right, kids, if that's what you want, we'll do it, uh, we'll do it right after Dennis's song. In fact, why don't we do it right now? Oh, thank you, Mr. Betty. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction, we're going to have a contest between the Lucky Strike Kids and the Quiz Kids. These children are here tonight to match wits with Mary Livingston, Don Wilson, Dennis Day, and Phil Harris, who are all raring to go. We'll learn them, my eh, fellas. That gives you an idea, folks. <laughs> now I, I, of course, will be the quiz master. You'll be the quiz master. Certainly. When I went to school, I was smart as a whip. Go on, you even need a blueprint over your lunchbox. Oh, <laughs> stop, will ya? Now, come on, let's get started with our questions. Now, first, we... Hold a minute. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you called, Rochester. Did the manager of the hotel room find a room for me? That's what I called. You got the bridal suite. The bridal suite? Good, good. Hey, did you move all my stuff in? No, I'm waiting for you to get here. What? I want to carry you over the threshold. <laughs> Stop being silly and get my clothes unpacked. I can't do that, boss, until I shovel the rice out of the room. Shovel the rice out? Who had the bridal suite before me? Tommy and Manville. Well, how do you know? There's a lawyer and a minister still sitting there. Oh. Well, hurry up and get that room cleaned up. Okay, but it's going to take hours and hours. Never mind, never mind. Unpack my clothes and lay out a clean shirt. I'm going to the Chez Paris tonight. Okay, I'll give you the one with the cellophane front so Charles Boyer can see the flow show. Good, good, good. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. Oh, say, Rochester, did you do what I told you about the candles? You know, there's a dim out at out here. Yes, sir, I, I went to the store and bought 85 of them. 85 candles? How did you get that many? Well, when I told the man they were for you, he just handed them over and said, Tell Mr. Benny, happy birthday. <laughs> well, that was very nice. Goodbye, Rochester. Goodbye. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're all set for the battle of wits. The Quiz Kids versus the Benny Kids. And may the best team win. You mean may the better team win. Yes. Yes. <laughs> better. I used to know that when I went to school, too. All right, let's go. And now I'll call the roll. First, the quiz kids. Harvey. I'm Harvey Van Fishman. I'm 15 years old and I'm a junior at South Shore High School. 
Now, Joel. I'm Joel Kupperman. I'm nine years old and I'm in the 5A in the Basso Public School. Oh, oh yes. You're the little fellow who's so clever at mathematics. And, and tell me, Joel, if an egg costs five cents, how much would a three egg omelet cost? Fifteen cents. That's right. He's never been to Shea Harry. <laughs> Mary, you mean they, they charge more there? Uh-oh. Boy is going to be early tonight. He is not. We can always go out for a walk. Now, Ruthie. I'm Ruthie Duskin. I'm 11 years old, and I'm the 8th grade at the University of Chicago Laboratory School. Cute, isn't she? Now, Richard. Uh, Richard. I'm Richard Lakesburg. I'm 6 years old, and I'm in 1A Trakes Trakes Public School. 6 years old. Gosh. Oh, it seems like... <laughs> oh, I wish you could see them, folks. The listeners. Gosh, it seems like as only yesterday I was 6... Hmm... Gee, Mr. Benny, that must have been about 30 years ago. Uh, uh, 31, Richard. 31. Have a bottle of pop on me. And now, and now for the Benny kids. Philip? I'm Philip Harris. I live in Encino, California. And three nights a week, I attend the Hollywood Recreation Pool Room. Isn't he cute? <laughs> what do you specialize in, Philip? The four ball in the side pocket. <laughs> now, now, Donald. Donald. I am Donald Wilson. I am six years old and I weigh 243 pounds. He's the cutest one of all. What's your ambition, Donald? I haven't any. That's why I'm so fat. Mm -hmm. I thought so. Sit down, but easy. Now, uh, uh, Mary. I'm Mary Livingston. I live in Beverly Hills and I graduated from the May Company. Oh, that's a lovely place. And what did you learn there? If you've worn the stockings, ma'am, you cannot exchange them. Very good. Isn't she bright? And uh, now, uh, uh, Dennis? I am Dennis. 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 Day. Dennis Day. How old are you, Dennis? I'll be one in December. You'll be, wait a minute. You'll be one? Yes, my mom's raffling me off. <laughs> well, you're a turkey if I ever saw one. And now, folks, if you've met all the kitties, we'll proceed with the battle of wits. And for each question used, I will score one point for the side that answers correctly. And furthermore, I am personally awarding a prize of $10 to the winning team. Well, that's fair enough. You'll find out. Mary. Now, our first question comes from Mrs. Len Le Leonard Francillo of Chicago. Well, listen carefully, Harvey. A coloptera, a musca domestica, and a lepidoptera were having a bit of a tete-a-tete -tete on a screen door. Now, if you suddenly appeared with a fly swatter, one of the party would leave quite hastily. Which one would it be? The coloptera, the musca domestica, or the lepidoptera? Have you got an answer, Harvey? Well, the musca domestica would leave because it's a common house fly. Oh. I mean, very good, very good. That's, uh, that's one point for the quiz kids. Now, Dennis, in order to be perfectly, absolutely fair, I'm going to ask you a question along the same lines. Now, listen carefully. What fly would you associate with butter? Well, uh, well, uh... Well, that may be a little tough, so I'll put it this way. Butter is associated with what fly? It's a butterfly. Ruthie, I didn't ask you. <laughs> Dennis, you didn't hear that answer, did you? No, I got ashes in my ear. Oh, uh, Mary Livingston? The butterfly. Correct. <laughs> and there's one point for the Benny kids. Both sides are even. Wait a minute, Mr. Benny. Sorry, Harvey, but we won on a technicality. Now, uh, let's see, uh... Oh, brother. Wait till you get them on their show. Mary, please. Now, here's a problem of mathematics sent in by Clifford Gordon, Tramp Street, Waukegan, Illinois. Well, gee, Mr. Benny, if it's a problem of mathematics, you should ask Joel Copperman. Oh. I have another question from Julius Fennington, Waukegan, Illinois. I think you can answer this, Ruthie. I'm ready, Mr. Benny. Now, this problem is in the field of ichthyology. Ichthyology? What's that? How do I know? Anyway, Ruthie, 
Name five types of fishes in order of their development and give examples of each. Go ahead. The five are stomata with lamprey eels and hatch fishes. Next comes the Elaeus meibromii with the sharks and rays. That's right. Next, the gnoidae, which are armored fishes. Uh huh. And after that comes the telestai, the chew fishes. Yes. And last of all, the dipnoi, which are lung fishes. Isn't that amazing? Very good, Ruthie. Now, Philip Harris. Yes, sir. I think it's only fair that I ask you the same type of question. How do you spell fish? <laughs> Come on, Phil. Go ahead. How do you spell fish? F-I-S-C-H. That's right. That's right. Joel Fish. I know him well. That's two points for the quiz kids and two points for the Benny kids. Now, Richard. Here's a problem in mathematics that comes from Dave Wolf from Chicago. Oh, Mr. Betty, if it's a problem in mathematics, why don't you ask Joel Kupperman? Harvey, don't ask me. Don't tell me how to run my contest. I'm going to ask Richard. Now, Richard, two men who earn $450 and $150 a month, respectively, decide to build a house and divide the cost in proportion to their income. Each of these two men has three sons who help with the work, but they cannot work full time. One works every day, the second every other day, the third every third day, and so on. Are you, uh, are you following, Richard? Yes, are you? <laughs> Don't worry about me, Bob. Now, they all work the first day, and they all finished the house the second day they all worked together. Each guy had three kids, huh? Phil, go away, William. You know for nothing. <laughs> now, Richard, Richard, one joint owner, I mean, one joint owner, has to pay $1,500 more than the other. How much did the house cost, and how long did it take to build it? Well, Dennis, I see you got your hand up. What is the answer? Butterfly! Right! That's three for the Benny kids and two for the... Wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Benny, you're on a different question. Oh, oh yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, well, Richard, have you got the answer yet, uh, Richard? Yes, sir, the house costs $3,000 and it'll take 60 years to build it. Excellent! $3,000 and 60 days is correct. How do you know? I trust Richard. <laughs> now, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Mr. Benny. Uh, what is it, Dennis? Button your shirt. Charles Boyer's peeping out. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, Richard earned another point for the quiz kids, making it three to three. Now, Mary, here is your question. The answer is 15. Wait till I ask you. Now, Mary, concentrate. If you had 20 apples and your mother took away 10 and gave you back 5, how many would you have? 15. You heard me. How did you know I was going to ask you? Boyer told me. Now cut that out. <laughs> Boyer told me. I told you to button your shirt. Why? Now here's a question for Donald Wilson. Donald, oh Don. He said. Yes? <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Now, Don, here's a question from Bert Stock of Salt Lake City. Now, Don, if you were on your way to a drugstore, and the drugstore was two miles away, and you could make it in 17 minutes, but you had to cross a bridge. Now, on this particular day, the bridge was washed out, and you had to row a boat across the river. How wide is the river? 350 feet. Mm -hmm. But there's a strong current carrying you downstream at the rate of 3.6 miles per hour. So it takes you an extra 23 minutes to reach the grocery store. Now here's the question. What would you buy when you got there? <laughs> a package of Lucky Strike. Absolutely correct. Now Donald, why would you buy that package of Lucky Strikes? Because Lucky Strikes means fine tobacco. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. Very good elaborating. The score is now five to three in favor of the Benny kids. Now, Harvey, here's a question for you. Well, if it's mathematics, you could ask Joel Kupperman. I just changed it to history. <laughs> now listen, 
What did the United States purchase from Denmark after World War I? The Virgin Islands for $21 million. You're wrong. It was $25 million. It was $21 million. The United States paid $25 million. Jack got to know. They borrowed the money from him. Certainly. I remember when I took Woodrow Wilson down into my vault. Now, another question in history. Dennis, who was the first president of the United States? Come on, Dennis. Who was the first president of the United States? Uh, um. Come on. George. George. My name is Dennis. I know. Now, who was the first president of the United States? He was the father of our country. George. George. Jessel. No. Anyway, I'm asking Dennis. My name is George. It is not. All right, Phil, I'll ask you. Who was the first president of the United States? George. George. What do women do on Monday? Washing? That's right. George. Washing. Washing. Blah. What am I sticking out at you? Your tongue. Correct. George Washington. The score is six to three in favor of the Benny Kids. We win, and the $10 bill goes to me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a frame up. Frame up? These questions were on the up and up. Well, you were cheating. Oh, yeah? Well, it's a good thing Richard didn't say that, believe me. Oh, come on, kids. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, how do you like that? A bunch of sore losers. Play, genius. today and we hope that you've enjoyed our show today and the next time you come across a kid you just might want to listen to what they have to say after all they tend to see the world a little more differently than you or I sometimes but we got a fantastic show coming up next a special command performance featuring a star-studded cast of Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra, Connie Haynes, Meredith Wilson, Francis Langford, the Denning sisters, Betty Hutton, Dennis Day and more as we celebrate the women of war the wax and waves with our 100th show here at the Oak Park Arms. It all, that's right, 100 shows we've done here. I know. That's what doing it steadily for 15 years will do. And it all happens right here on Sunday, April 29th at 2 o'clock, right here at the Oak Park Arms. And of course, you can always uh, look up our website at www.ttdyradio.com for more updates and the latest information. We are already planning our uh, upcoming 16th season with more exciting, wonderful shows, celebrating women and uh, the Year of Women in Old Time Radio, as well as some other great surprises. But now, the cast of those thrilling days of yesteryear, Connor Gosain, Glenn Royal, Max O'Connor, Ella Gosain, and Cooper Gosain. And I suppose I should mention the supporting cast of Don Gingle, Jim Martin, Tim Baker, Amy Brockman, and of course, no radio show would be complete without the synchronous sound effects stylings of Gwen Royal and Amy Brockman on sound effects. And also, amazing special thanks to the magnificent musical magic of Gracie Farnham. And I am your director and producer, who also was in Ben <laughs> On behalf of the cast, we would like to extend our thanks to you, the audience, for once again helping our show to come alive and for living those thrilling days of yesteryear so that we could bring them back to you. Thank you. Yeah.